Thank you. I'm Karen Osborne. I'm a midwater biologist in the invertebrate zoology department here at the Smithsonian. Uh, the main goal of my research program is to contribute to our knowledge of pelagic invertebrate community composition and evolution. Pelagic invertebrates are all of those animals without backbones that live below the surface of the ocean and above the seafloor. I work towards this broad goal by integrating three areas of biology. Natural history forms the basis of all the work that I do. Evolutionary biology provides the framework and the driving questions. And oceanography puts it all in context. So today I want to talk to you about a subject that's become of increasing interest to me that I'm just starting to work on, and that's connectivity in the open ocean. So for a long time, we've been studying the oceans. We've been draw, dragging trawl nets through them and um, looking at these incredibly dynamic, huge habitat. And generally, we assumed that the ocean was well mixed over evolutionary time. And so as we studied the animals, uh, with that assumption in mind, we assume that most of the oceanic animals have very broad geographic ranges. Um, that is supported by the fact that many of the groups have very constrained morphology in this habitat. Some don't, of course. Um, but primarily it's driven by the limited sampling. This is the largest habitat on Earth. It's dynamic. It's changing. Um, we have sampled very small amount, very small amount of it. Um, and often when we do, our samples from very far apart, and so it's hard to see how the variation is. Um, I'm going to borrow a slogan from microbiology, everything is everywhere. Is this the case in the oceans as well, or are there actually barriers to dispersal as we start to look closer? So the majority of my field work I do in collaboration with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute using their remotely operated vehicles like this one. It's essentially a large robot that we send down into the ocean depths packed with cameras, sensors, and collecting devices, and we can actually look at the animals in their habitat. We can measure very precisely the conditions that they're experiencing. We can see who's there, when they're there, and where exactly they're at. Um, and that makes it so that we can address questions on all those other animals that aren't the fish and the crustaceans that we can get in trawls and look at what they're doing. It gives us a, a much broader diversity and a better complete picture. The other amazing technology that's come along in the last few decades is genetics. And genetics allow us to relate those disparate samples that came from one ocean basin and another ocean basin and directly ask questions about how they're related um, and assess the variation that we see in those samples. And so both of those tools have made it possible in the last several years to identify many cryptic species within widespread oceanic taxa. Here's several examples. And that leads to the question, are most widespread species actually multiple species out there? The example I want to talk to you about today is Peobius mycerius. Peobius uh, is a segmented worm or a polychaete, despite the fact that you can't see any segments there and there are no chaetae, which are the <laughs> distinguishing characteristics for the group. I assure you, it is a polychaete. Um, but it is an unusual polychaete in an, and an unusual midwater animal in that it has a very broad depth distribution. They're found um, throughout the eastern Pacific, um, so it's not a huge geographic range, but they are found from almost the surface down to about 3,000 meters, and that's very unusual. Most midwater animals have a couple hundred meters to maybe a thousand meter depth range. 3,000 meters is huge which made me think that, okay, there's a ton of them out there, and they have a really wide depth range. They're a perfect candidate for some cryptic species being found. So I looked at their distribution, and the, the histogram that you see here is uh, individual, individual video observations. There's 130,000 of them from the last 18 years. It's a very abundant animal. Um, and what I found is this bimodal distribution, which smacks of there being two species, because there's no physical um, characteristics of the water column that would create that kind of distribution. So I collected a bunch of specimens from the three different depths that you see um, highlighted with the stars. And here is what I found based on, this is just one of the genes that I looked at, the CO1 gene. And what you're looking at here is a haplotype network. Each of these small circles represents a single unique genetic sequence from a single individual. Um, the larger circles that have numbers in them show you how many replicates we found in different individuals. The light colored circles represent shallow specimens. The dark circles represent deep specimens. You see it is a complete mess. This was a nightmare figure to make. Um, there is no relation with depth. You would expect to see you know, the dark circles all together and the light circles all together, but that's not the case. Um, so in the northeastern Pacific, from 
50 meters down to 3,000 meters, it's one big mixed population. They're all reproducing together as one big population unit. What we did find that was interesting is that we found four other haplotypes or four other individuals that didn't connect with this network. They were more than 10% genetically different for this gene. And two of those individuals came from the Gulf of California, which is an isolated gulf uh, along the coast of Mexico. Unfortunately, I only had those two specimens. We went back last year and collected every one that I could find, and here's where they fell out. So it appears that there is a second species in the Gulf of Mexico, or the Gulf of California. Um, but remember that two of those haplotypes, two of those individuals came from Monterey. So we can start to address that question, is everything everywhere or is it dispersal barriers? There could be an argument that there's dispersal barriers here, but since we have leakage between the two populations, it's um, probably more along the idea of everything is everywhere. Oh, before we get to that, so follow-up research to this that I don't have time to talk about is that the males of this species ontogenetically migrate. So they move as they mature down into deep water, and that's how this mixing probably occurs. So the next uh, example I want to show you is work by my postdoc, Stephanie Bush, who's looking at sea butterflies. She's just arrived a few months ago. So this is her preliminary data looking at pteropod mollusks. Um, she's looked at three species that were supposedly very widespread species. Cavalina inflexa, she collected off of California and in the North Atlantic, and there are greater than 8% difference. Cavalina uncinata, similar story. Corolla calceola, found in the Gulf of California and off the coast of California, similarly 8% difference. So those three widespread species are actually at least two species. Uh, in contrast, Cleo pyramidata, which she collected off of Hawaii, off of California, Gulf of California, and North Atlantic, there was less than 2% difference between any of those samples. And so that really truly is one widespread species. To summarize, there are widespread species out there. Some of them truly are widespread. Most of them are not. Um, only by studying the biology of these animals are we going to be able to say anything about which of the widespread species really probably truly are without going out and testing every single one. So it's really important that we get out there, look at these animals, see what they're doing, how they're behaving, um, so that we can understand their, um, their biology. And the, at the bottom of the slide there is just a teaser for the next phase of a project looking at isopods and one aspect of the biology with their species de delineation. With that, I'd like to thank those who invite me uh, out to sea and those who help in the lab and, and at sea. Thank you very much. Jean. Um, so Jean asked uh, why the bimodal depth distribution, if it's not two species, what, uh, what is my hypothesis for why they have such a distinct bimodal distribution? Um, I believe that it has to do with the particles in the water. Um, these are particle feeders, and there's an oxygen minimum zone from about 400 meters down to about 900 meters that's pretty intense. And the particles that pass through there and, and pass out, they change fairly dramatically once they come out of that oxygen minimum zone. And uh, POB, it's, I believe it's a, a play between the particles that are available and com competition with other organisms that are out there. So, but that's surely hand-waving. Thank you.